SACPA acknowledges that this event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, and we pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to the land. SACPA commits to assist reconciliation efforts by raising awareness of the ways past and present injustices can be reconciled. Our speaker today is Chelsea Mattis, and I'm going to let her uh, say what she wants to about herself, but she's speaking on the connection uh, of gut and brain. And um, uh, please join me in welcoming Chelsea. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here today. So my name is Chelsea Mattis. I have a master's in parasitology um, from the University of Lethbridge and I have a PhD in gastrointestinal sciences from the University of Calgary. Um, and I then came down to the Canadian Centre for Behavioural Neurosciences at the University of Lethbridge, where I've been working as a postdoctoral scholar. So I've been interested in, in parasites, which seems a little peripheral, but it's not really, um, and how the gut and the brain communicate with each other. And increasingly, it's become, really, there's been a revolution in terms of how our understanding of how the, how the gut and the brain communicate with each other because of the technology that allows us to understand the microbiome in our bodies. And so there's a lot of information that can be very useful to us and our journey to health and wellness. And so I'm hoping today that you'll have a better understanding and appreciation of how the gut works and the different ways that the gut and the brain communicate with each other and how we can leverage that knowledge to improve health and wellness. So when I talk about the gut, I'm talking about the tube that runs from your gums to your bum. And this tube, also called the gastrointestinal tract, but it's just easier to say gut, is compartmentalized into different compartments for different functions. We have the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach, the small intestine, and the large intestine. And as well, related to the process of digestion are a variety of different um, organs that are very important for metabolism and important for the production of enzymes like bile and trypsin and, and hydrochloric acid. Digestion is an extremely complicated process. Not only do we have to have the enzymes produced at the right time, but also in the right amount. You don't want to have a lot of hydrochloric acid produced in your stomach if you don't have any food there. You don't want to have just consumed a steak and then have a bunch of lipases being released because lipases break down fats. You want something that'll break down those proteins into amino acids. So that must, needs to be really carefully regulated. As well, the length of time that food spends in these different compartments in our gut is very important. So when we swallow food and it transports down to the stomach, we only have about 10 seconds of, of time where that food is in the esophagus, which you don't want any longer than that. Um, when you have food that's in the stomach and it's not being emptied at the right rate, that can cause problems. That can cause uh, reflux and, and heartburn occurring. And if food is moving too quickly through your colon, you might have diarrhea, or too slowly you'll have constipation. So regulating the enzymes that be produced in the right amounts, in the right time, and the amount of time it takes for food to move through your body, that's called motility, is a very important process and it is worthy of a brain. And that is something that we do have in our gut. So if you were to take a cross section of the gut, the inside of that tube, we call that the lumen. And you don't need to worry too much about these layers, but the, the gut, gut has these um, multiple layers within it. Um, Importantly, between several of these layers lie plexus, the submucosal plexus and the myenteric plexus. And these are the brain's gut, or the gut's brain, rather. This is called the enteric nervous system. And it's two to three thick layers of neurons that extend across the entire length of your gastrointestinal tract. And if you were to stain them a bright fluorescent green, it would look something like this network here. So the myenteric plexus lies between the circular and longitudinal muscles, and it's controlling the movement of food, the motility of food, whereas the submucosal plexus is controlling absorption and secretion. So there are more neurons in your gut than there are in your spinal cord. 
It has more than 20 neurotransmitters in your gut, variety of different subtypes of neurons, and 50% of your body's dopamine is in the gut. 90% of your body's serotonin is in the gut. So it's a very fascinating organ. Um, first, I'm going to talk to you about the way that the gut and the brain communicate using the endocrine system. This is hormones. So just a little reviewer on how digestion occurs. I think sometimes it helps us to visualize what's happening in our gut to better understand some of the concepts we'll be talking about today. So we have here a very thin single cell layer of epithelial cells in our gut called enterocytes, inside cell that means. And these cells are absorbing nutrients as they get broken down into the smaller, smallest parts, glucoses, amino acids, fatty acids. They get absorbed across this gut barrier and enter the bloodstream. Or in the case of fatty acids, they actually enter the lymphatic system. They enter a different system. So that's how nutrients are absorbed. But about 1% of these enterocytes is this fabulous little cell called an enteroendocrine cell. There's many different subtypes of these cells, and they function as the gut's taste buds. So they have this um, cute little tuft on the top. If I can just find my cursor here. Oh, there she is. This cursor is feminine, apparently. So um, we have these little tufts here, and they are sensing nutrients that are coming through the lumen. Now these cells are really cool because on the basolateral oh. side, on the bottom part of this cell, which is closest to the blood vessels, they are packed with different kinds of hormones. So one subtype of this enteroendocrine cell called an L cell, when it's stimulated, it releases a hormone called glucagon-like peptide. So this is just one of the many different kinds of hormones released in the process of digestion. But glucagon-like peptide is cool because it enters the bloodstream and it migrates into the bloodstream, it gets into the brain, and it tells a certain region of the brain to stop eating. It suppresses appetite. So this is one way by sensing food, it can tell the brain to stop eating food. Now glucagon-like peptide is a really interesting one because scientists have been able to develop something that looks very, very much like it and acts like GLP in the gut. However, it doesn't break down as quickly. Um, so this drug is really important and has been really beneficial for people managing type 2 diabetes. It's called Ozempic, and perhaps you've heard of this. It's so potent in maintaining itself in the body, you only need a single weekly injection. And that's in part because it doesn't get broken down the same way that GLP does in our bodies. But interestingly enough, you can actually consume foods that stimulate these L cells to produce glucagon-like peptides. Olive oil and avocados and nuts are all excellent ways to stimulate these L cells to produce GLP to help suppress appetite and regulate um, insulin, for example. Other foods can actually re um, inhibit the enzyme that'll break down GLP. So black beans are something that, can br that um, will inhibit GLP from breaking down, so it'll stay in your body for longer. So this is just one of the cool ways that we can kind of use food and our diet to sort of hack the system in a way to um, take advantage of the fact that there are sort of nature's ozempic available to us in our diet. So this is one of the main jobs, of course, of the gut, is, is the job of digestion, and it's a very important job, of course. But this is often overlooked in terms of the other important job of the gut, and that is defense. So our bodies work so hard to keep the outside outside, right? We have mucosal membranes, we have skin that multiple layers thick to make sure that things stay outside. But then here we go, we're putting things inside of our bodies, and that might come with environmental toxins or pathogens. So our guts need to be very good at defending against these kinds of things. So I'm gonna tell next a little bit about some of the great adaptations we have to help defend our bodies against some of these things. One, of course, the immune system. So 70 to 80% of your immune system is in your gut. Not only defending against potential invaders and pathogens, but also helping your body recognize that the food that you put in your gut is not something to be um, scared of. You don't want an immune response against the things that you're eating. That's, that, will, um, that becomes an allergy. These enterocytes are also very important. So these form the gut barrier. This is a single cell layer thick between 
all of the outside environment and inside of your body. We have layers and layers of skin cells to protect us from the outside. Only a single layer of cells thick for these enterocytes. And these cells need really, really tight junctions. So they're actually proteins called tight junctions that hold these cells together. Sometimes nutrients and water will pass through these cells, so they want to be able to regulate what comes through. But maintaining that really tight junction is important because if it's not, um, if you don't have that tightness, then you can have bad things kind of trickling through. And that's what's often called leaky gut. And finally, we also have the mucus layer. This is this gorgeous thick layer of mucus that lines your entire gastrointestinal tract. And it is produced by these goblet cells that just pump out tons and tons of mucus. So these uh, fun little shapes here represent the gut microbiome, which we'll be talking about later. But notice that they're not actually touching these enterocytes. These enterocytes are not able to distinguish good from bad bacteria. And so this mucosal layer is really important to ensure that you have that sterile layer to make sure that you're not having that immune response developing. So we're now going to talk about the second way that the gut and the brain talk to each other, and that's through the immune system. One thing that is important to note is that any kind of inflammation that you have in your body, in the periphery, is going to drive neuroinflammation, inflammation in the brain. Now that sounds a little terrifying, but it's transient, and you've all experienced neuroinflammation. Anytime that you have sickness behaviors, sick, if you're sick, you will be experiencing neuroinflammation. So changes in behavior occur because we have changes in our brain. And neuroinflammation is a beautiful way that our bodies have developed to help um, with the response, the immune response against some sort of pathogen that is making you sick. So like this sick girl here, you're experiencing the symptoms like lethargy, fatigue, social withdrawal, anhedonia, that's like not enjoying the things you normally enjoy. I mean, that's really adaptive because mounting immune responses is very, very energetically expensive. And so this is a very clever way for your body to, to force you to rest and recover to help divert these energy um, resources towards the immune response. But there's also a second sort of suite of sickness behaviors we maybe don't consider as much, and that is these behaviors related to threat um, assessments. So let's think back to our ancestors, our, our ape and chimp ancestors, who had to be really vigilant um, during times of sickness. And when they'd go down to the watering hole, if you've watched National Geographic, you know the animals that need to be extra careful around the watering hole are those that are injured or sick. And so vigilance, they need to be even more aware of all the potential threats. And of course, we're social animals, so we also have to be aware of social threats as well. So I, I don't really have any evidence for this, but I think this is why we feel extra irritable when we're sick against the people that we are trying to care for us, is because it's sort of we're just extra um, annoyed by, by, by the socialness around us. But in the case of animals, animals become extra anxious um, when they are sick. So in considering this, you know, when you are sick and then the gut inflammation goes away, the neuroinflammation goes away, you feel better. But this isn't the case for people who suffer from many chronic inflammatory diseases. Um, so one of the things I study is inflammatory bowel disease in mice. Um, and, but there's many other different kinds of uh, gut-related diseases and disorders, like irritable bowel syndrome, celiac disease, functional dyspepsia, very, very diverse group of diseases and disorders. But they all share one thing, and that is they are all comorbid. They all co-occur with anxiety, depression, and cognitive dysfunction at rates that are much greater than, than the healthy population. And so you might think, well, of course, these people are depressed and anxious and they're not thinking straight. These people are suffering from diseases and disorders that are interfering with their life. The psychological burden of disease is one component that leads to these mood disorders. But there's also, the, of course, that biological component, that peripheral neuroinflammation driving neuroinflammation in the brain. And that is actually changing neural circuitry in the brain. And it's changing neural circuits to the point that even when people are in remission from disease, you still have elevated levels of anxiety and depression. And what's really remarkable is that people that suffer from some of these diseases, if you're in remission and you 
and you experience some kind of um, psychosocial threat, like maybe you got fired from your job, or you're having a fight with your, your partner, or your, your animal, your pet died or something, those kind of stressors are actually enough to trigger inflammation in your gut and trigger a flare-up of disease or perhaps a bout of diarrhea or gastrointestinal pain. And that really highlights this bi-directional communication that is occurring between the gut and the brain. And that leads me to a third way that our guts and brains talk to each other, and that is through the nervous system. So the vagabond is a Latin term, and that means wanderer, right? Well, the root word for vagabond is vagus, and that is a very apt description for this nerve, the vagus nerve. This nerve innervates many of the visceral organs in your body, the heart, the lungs, the liver, the gut. And what's really fascinating about this nerve is it's a huge bundle of neurons. And the vast majority of these neurons, 90% of them within this nerve, are called sensory neurons. That means they're taking information from these organs and bringing that information up to your brain. So this sensory information might include like chemical composition, uh, pain, um, things related to inflammation or maybe the presence of a bacteria. And it's bringing that information up to your brain and then the brain is processing that information. And then with the remaining 10% of nerves in the vagus nerve, it's relaying these effector responses, telling the heart rate to slow down, the gastrointestinal tract to increase motility, things like that. So bear with me while I give you a, a little bit of a neuroscience lesson here. Your nervous system includes this component called the autonomic nervous system. So this is the part of the nervous system you can't control. Um, and it is divided into two arms, your parasympathetic arm and your sympathetic nerve arm. Now we're, I think, much more familiar with the sympathetic arm of this nervous system. This is your fight and flight responses. And it uses adrenaline as a neurotransmitter. And so when this is activated, we have, it's a very fast activation, activating system and, and we have you know, increased pupil dilation, we're hearing better, we're attending to different movements better, increased blood flow to the skeletal muscles. This is something you want to have happen really quickly. This is in opposition to the parasympathetic nervous system, which is your rest, digest, feed, and breed response. And this is what the nerve, vagus nerve is part of, this, um, this system. Now, these systems actually work in opposition to each other. When your sympathetic nervous system is activated, it tells your parasympathetic nervous system to shut down. And this is great. This makes great sense. If you're evading a predator on the savanna, you want increased blood flow to your skeletal muscles. You want to have everything available in your power to get out of there and to evade um, predation, right? You don't want to be thinking about feeding and breeding and resting and digesting. So it makes sense that that shuts down. However, we live in this environment now where we are not evading predators on the savanna. We are suffering from deadlines and trying to get your kids to their various um, activities on time. and and all kinds of different stressors in, in, in terms of, of health issues or, or um, anxiety about what's happening um, across the ocean in different countries, that's triggering this sympathetic nervous system response. Um, and that's to the detriment of our parasympathetic nervous system. Now there's one other thing your parasympathetic nervous system does when it's activated that is really important. When your vagus nerve gets activated, it actually produces this anti-inflammatory response. Um, it's this brilliant mechanism your body has sort of produced to kind of put the brakes on inflammation because the body recognizes that too much inflammation can be a bad thing. And so when people have an activated vagus nerve, it actually tells immune cells in the body to stop producing pro-inflammatory molecules. So this is called this anti-inflammatory vagal reflex or anti-inflammatory vagal pathway. So then what happens though when you have constant activation of your sympathetic nervous system? And this is what people who are suffering from anxiety experience. Constant activation of their sympathetic nervous system and they're suppressing this parasympathetic nervous system which is also suppressing this anti-inflammatory vagal reflex. So it would be wonderful if there was some way we could activate this parasympathetic re um, system to help us suppress that sympathetic response. And it turns out there are ways that we can do this. This is through deep breathing, through meditation, through yoga, through eating fiber. 
And so now I'm going to go on to the final pathway, and that is the microbiome. So the microbiome is the ecosystem that exists in your body, the collection of bacteria, of viruses, and fungi in your body. And we have many different microbiomes in our body. There's a microbiome in our lungs, a microbiome on our skin, but I'm going to be focusing on the one in our gut. And all of these different microbiomes in our body have different communities of bacteria, of viruses, and fungi. Uh, the research is largely focused on bacteria, and so that's what the, um, most of this will be talking about. So your gut microbiome is established at birth. The first thing you're, you, you, when you're established, it, it is uh, about how your birth process occurred. It, were you born vaginally? Because then you're going to be exposed to the vaginal microbiome, which includes enrichment with lactobacillus. And babies born vaginally have enriched lactobacillus, that's bacteria, in their, in their gut microbiome. Babies born out the sunroof, a cesarean section, they have a gut microbiome that's more enriched with the mum's um, skin microbiome, so more staphylococcus, for example. And it just gets changed and changed from there, whether there's formula or breast milk being fed, um, the mode, uh, or pardon me, the, the age at which the, in the infant was delivered, um, the kind of diet that the mum is eating, uh, exposure to antibiotics, and it just is constantly getting established. Um, and so one of the things that people often ask, and researchers have asked, well, what is a healthy microbiome? What is it that I want? So there's no one healthy microbiome. However, there is a picture of a microbiome that is more healthy than the others. So if you look at these two ecosystems, we have a monoculture of some kind of crop, and we have a very, very diverse rainforest. Out of these two ecosystems, which do you think is going to be more resilient to some kind of perturbation, whether it's um, a, a, an infection or some kind of, you know, the treatment with antibiotics or something? It's the diverse rainforest that is going to be able to withstand some kind of perturbation better. And that is what research seems to be saying, is that while we don't know what a perfect healthy microbiome looks like, we know that the one that is most diverse is, a, is correlated with healthiness. And so the bacterial diversity within our gut is very important. And this changes as we age. So as I mentioned before, when it's colonizing, the bacterial microbiome is being colonized, um, that rapidly changes. So as babies learn to start crawling, they put everything in their mouths and they're inoculating themselves with the bacteria in their environment. Whether the baby has some older siblings, um, or whether they have a cat or a dog, is it an indoor cat or an outside cat? Do they go to a big school, or are they homeschooled? Are they living in a farm or in the city? What kind of diet are they exposed to? All of these things contribute to the ecosystem in their microbiome. And the bacterial diversity increases up to adulthood, and then it starts to decline as we get older. And so one of the reasons why scientists believe that diversity is so important is that many different kinds of diseases are associated with reduced diversity in the microbiome. So we have this, we've developed in this core kind of more consistent microbiome by about three years old. But it's the peripheral microbiome that seems to be more plastic and more able to be changed by different environmental factors. Now the function of the microbiome is very diverse. It helps us produce vitamins. It actually can produce its own neurotransmitters that act on our body. The microbiome helps defend against invaders. Five minutes? Thanks. Um, it also helps educate the immune system. So really, really important functions. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit, a couple stories about the power of, of poop. Um, so if you were to take all of the water, if you were to desiccate your poop, 50 to 80 percent of it would be bacteria. Remarkable. So there is a bacterial infection called Clostridium difficile, and it is notoriously difficult to treat. Um, if you get it once, you're 20% more likely to get it again. If you get it twice, you're 40% more likely to get it again. It follows this 20, 40, 60 rule. And researchers um, were trying to figure out how to deal with this recurring C. difficile infection that's really common in hospitals because it's so infectious. So they actually did a study where they took two groups of people that had C. diff. One, they gave them the standard antibiotic treatment, and the other one, using a colonoscopy kind of procedure, they took stool from healthy donors and smeared it along the colon. 
I know it's not very glamorous, but sometimes uh, science isn't glamorous. And they compared the, the, how, how many people responded to these two treatment groups. They actually had to stop the study early because it was no longer ethical to continue withholding the fecal microbiome transplant treatment to the control group that was only receiving antibiotics. Only 30% of people were responding to the antibiotics, whereas 92% were responding to the treatment with the FMT, the fecal microbiome transplant. So really effective treatment, and I can tell you too, poop is a lot cheaper than antibiotics. <laughs> so this, the, the power of poop, it can also be a therapeutic. And researchers are finding that you can take the feces from people diagnosed with major depressive disorder, put that into a mouse, and that mouse's behavior will actually change. That mouse will start exhibiting depressive-like behaviors. It'll stop communicating with its buddies. It won't be as interested in goldfish crackers. And here's a fun fact. Goldfish crackers, mice find more appealing than cocaine, um, which, is, <laughs> which is great because it's a lot easier to procure goldfish crackers than it is from uh, cocaine from Health Canada. So uh, bacteria is really affecting, able to affect your mood as well. So to achieve gut brain health, we need to focus on our diet. The more diverse your diet is, the more diverse your microbiome is going to be. One of the things that we can really focus on is fiber because our North American diet is wildly deficient in fiber. And fiber is important because we don't eat it. We eat, I mean, we eat it, but we don't actually absorb it. So the fiber that makes its way in your, through your small intestine actually then also meets up with your colon. And the bacteria in your colon, the highest density of bacteria on the planet in your colon, are very hungry and they finally are able to eat some food because um, your greedy small intestine didn't absorb it all. And so when they eat fiber, when they come into contact with dietary fiber, they actually start metabolizing it and fermenting it and produce these molecules called short chain fatty acids and they're absorbed by the cells of the gut and used as an energy source. So remember I told you that, those, uh, that, that maintaining that tight gut barrier is an energy dependent process. It takes energy to, to make that, that tight connection. Fiber is helping provide that energy that those cells need. As well, these short chain fatty acids get up into the circulation system and they can do a variety of things. They can strengthen the blood brain barrier in your brain as well. They can reduce neuroinflammation, they can activate the vagus nerve, which of course we know is beneficial, and just injecting these things into mice can reduce anxiety and depressive-like behaviors. So just some ideas for optimizing gut-brain health. I always suggest that a food and mood journal might be a good place to start, just as simple or as complex as you want to make it. And peeking at your poop. So this is the Bristol stool chart, which sort of categorizes poop into seven different categories. Um, ideally, you want a type 3 or a type 4 that sinks to the bottom of the toilet. And so looking at your poop might give you an indication in terms of, do I have enough fiber? Is there evidence of a little bit of inflammation in there? Um, and so the Bristol stool chart is available online, um, and you can check that out. Increasing food diversity, of course, is a big one, and our fiber intake. I mean, it can't be overstated how much fiber is beneficial to our health as well increasing vagal tone through those different things, including fiber, but also meditative practices, yoga, deep breathing. Um, and so with that, I just want to highlight again these three ways that our gut and brain communicate, the immune pathway, the hormones, neurons, and the way that the microbiome interacts with all of these different pathways. So thank you so much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. I want to thank some uh, groups that are part of our, our life. Uh, thanks to the LSCO who provide this space free of charge and they just appreciate our use of the cafeteria. And thanks to the University of Lethbridge who are, have been a, uh, uh, an, an ally of this organization since we began. Thanks to Lethbridge Herald and other media, including Rogers for uh, your support. And, um, and thanks to Rogers, you can uh, find these sessions on, uh, on TV and on, uh, on the uh, sacbook.ca archive and also YouTube. So, and I wanted to let you know finally about next week's uh, presentation. David Carpenter is speaking on the Canadian, the Canadian uh, pension plan and the Alberta pension plan and that discussion. And I want you to note that it's on Wednesday, not Thursday. Uh, this space is not available to us 
uh, on Thursday and Friday next week, so it is Wednesday. Write it on your hand. And tell your friends who might be coming next week who aren't here today, next Wednesday. And uh, let's, let's jump right into the Q&A. So I uh, invite you to line up along this window here. Perhaps you can pull your chair in just a, sh a shade. And uh, uh, I'll ask you to give your, your name, first and last name, and be brief. And I'm going to ask you to, to stand in this position so the camera picks you up, and Chelsea does. And uh, we, we hope uh, you'll come forward with questions. Leona. Leona Jacobs, thanks for that talk. A lot of information. Presented very well, I might add. Um, so food fads. Uh, currently, there seems to be a little bit of a push about fermented fruit, foods. And so how does that fit into the whole issue of the bio? Good or bad? How does it affect the system, et cetera? Uh, thank you so much for asking that question. It was something I wanted to include in my talk, but for time reasons wasn't able to. So I actually believe I have a slide on fermented foods because they are a wonderful way that we can increase the diversity of our diet because they include three things in addition to the food itself, prebiotics, probiotics, and postbiotics. Prebiotics are things that your gut microbiome eats that you can't, like fibers. Um, and prebiotics, in fact, are, are very rich in, in breast milk, which is one of the reasons why they're so, it's so good for babies. Um, probiotics um, are, of course, the bacteria themselves in yogurt, but in all fermented foods. And then postbiotics are the things that the bacteria produce that are so beneficial, like short-chain fatty acids. And so uh, fermented foods are a great way to increase diversity of, of your diet. They have lots of excellent things. So absolutely, I think it's a great um, a fad to jump on. I'm Maureen Hawkins. I want to say thank you for an interesting presentation. Um, there's been, of course, even before this push on that, was, was buying probiotics. Are they worth buying and taking, and how do you decide which ones? Again, a very excellent question, and I'm going to jump you, you guys are just reading my minds here. What about probiotics? So probiotics are, like I said before, are the bacteria that you eat. And, um, and they're the bacteria that, that hopefully get incorporated into your gut. The problem with probiotics is it's not regulated. You don't know if, they, if they're, uh, the number of bacteria that are claiming to be present on the bottle are actually in there and how many are alive. Um, and how many actually establish? So you're, yes, you're eating them, but are they actually able to establish in in the, within your, um, the, ac the acidity of your stomach. You know, maybe with yogurt, you're, you're getting all these other things that are delivered that still maintain the, the, uh, the probiotic to be able to establish in your gut, but um, that might not be the case for this. Um, in Inter-batch variability, this is not regulated, so one batch to the next might be very, very different. It's also not diverse. If you look at the composition of the probiotics in these, three, four, maybe five, maybe sometimes up to 10 different. We, we have thousands of species in our gut and the diversity just isn't there and it kind of makes you wonder, well, you know, what is the benefit of that? Also, incredibly expensive, incredibly expensive and are they even efficacious? So there's one study that came out where they were looking at people that um, had some sort of um, uh, post-antibiotic gut so they, they took antibiotics, which are a great thing. We'd, I don't want to slam antibiotics at all. But antibiotics are notorious for able to um, also remove the, the bacteria that's good. They have a hard time distinguishing the good and bad. And so these researchers thought, well, maybe by introducing a probiotic with the antibiotic, we can help reduce some of those, those good bacteria from being so depleted. And so that's what they did. They gave people this antibiotic, or people that were on the antibiotic, they gave some of them probiotics, some of them just a placebo pill. They were really surprised because they actually found that the people that were taking the probiotics after the antibiotics, it took even longer for their gut microbiome to get back to normal. It was actually impeding their microbiome from, from coming back to that healthy kind. So that suggests that it's not particularly efficacious in this case. Uh, that being said, you know, there's always gonna be some you know, that some 
probiotics are, are not all equal. There's some that are um, this V3 cocktail that I know has to be kept in the fridge, for example, but that's not really where we're buying our probiotics, is it? We're buying them on a shelf in Shoppers Drug Mart. Um, so that's, again, leading to the best probiotic are the ones in fermented foods that are more likely to establish in your gut. I'm Susan Pickett. I'm wondering if you have any recommendations on how many grams of fiber, how many grams of fiber are beneficial? You said that it was important to increase that. Yes. Thank you, the number of grams of fiber. So I actually have a little stat in here that I had to kind of race through to get through in time. But um, for men and women, it's slightly different just due to different dietary needs, but 25 grams of fiber for women and 38 grams for men. So, all we, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's hard to try and increase the amount of fiber in our diet because we have such over-processed foods, but um, it's, you know, of course, definitely worth it. And sort of the more you get used to eating it, the, the easier it becomes. Klaus Jericho. Thank you, Charlie, for the wonderful review. Um, I gather the microbiome Michael, Michael, biome is very difficult to change. And uh, I do take sauerkraut every morning, hoping to help it along, but it's apparently very difficult to change the microbiome. So uh, we are stuck really with what we have got. And also, we really don't know which bacteria, which microorganisms are beneficial and which ones are not as beneficial. Is that true? <clears throat> Thank you for the question. So um, I do have some good news for you. Even though we have this core microbiome that is quite resistant to change, that is one that's established by three years old, this more plastic microbiome, the kind of peripheral, is much more able to be changed by things, including diet. So studies have been published to indicate that diet um, reliably and reproducibly changes your gut microbiome in a very short period of time. So these were studies done in uh, published in Nature, so very excellent, reputable journals. Um, for example, going from a meat-based diet to a plant-based diet rapidly changes um, your microbiome. As well, I take comfort in knowing that bacteria live very short lives. 20 minutes is, is kind of a generational cycle. So in my mind, I think, you know, if we can just eat a good diet for three days, we've like, you know, we've, we've killed the generations and generations of bacteria that perhaps were not ones that were helping us. And while science is trying to figure out who are the good guys and who are the bad guys in our gut, it's, it's obvious that many different microbiome, many different bacteria in the microbiome play a similar role. That's why you can't say there's one healthy microbiome because there might be 40 different species that are involved in the metabolism of this kind of, of, of um, pathway. And so taking one out isn't going to maybe make things bad or worse. But certain bacteria it have been able to be really studied um, closely, um, lots of lactobacillus. Um, and you'll see some of these in the probiotics, L. ruteri, um, rhamnosus. Some of these have been studied isolated and then um, studied in, in mouse models, for example. Um, so those ones are. Uh, there's certainly increasing understanding of which are the good guys and what are they doing and how are they doing it. It's just a matter of cultivating these strains. And sometimes these strains are not easy to cultivate because they live in these anaerobic environments that are hard to access. But the technology has been improving so quickly. And just a couple hours north of us, we have the International Microbiome Center at the University of Calgary that is able to cultivate these really challenging strains and produce these mouse models that only have 15 species that kind of represent um, large components of our microbiome, so we can really kind of tease out who's doing what. Um, as well, it's important to recognize these bacteria talk to each other. They're not living in isolation. So, you know, that might be a hard thing too, is even if you, ing even if you consume a whole bunch of bacteria, one particular probiotic, um, maybe it doesn't have friends in the microbiome that are able to help it kind of um, live and, and, and foster in there. So I hope that answers your question.
Uh, I'm Trevor Page. Thanks for a, a very informative and fluent presentation with slides that could actually be seen and the text read. So thank you for that. You mentioned Ozempic in your talk. Does that work for diabetes 1 as well as diabetes 2? It's more treating type 2. So I just wasn't sure if your question was finished. So, yeah, Ozempic is used to manage type 2 diabetes um, and, and regulate the blood glucose levels on that front. Yeah. You. You're welcome. Hi, Henning Mundell is my name. Um, the last few weeks we've had a sessions here dealing with the different aspects of the brain. You're number three. Um, so I want to ask you about possibly integrating a bit in relation to the previous ones where we dealt with uh, dementia with, uh, and uh, specifically Alzheimer's. And uh, you talked here a lot about the so good guys and bad guys in relation to digestion, inflammation, and so on. But how about foods that either contribute either to towards the negative, towards increased dementia, or the opposite, delaying onset of dementia or development? Yes, excellent question. Uh, I do know that my um, um, colleague, Dr. Sutherland, was here a few weeks ago. Maybe that was just last week, talking about uh, dementia. So a couple things. We know that um, dementia is associated with reduced microbiome, microbiome diversity. So increasing diversity, it's not necessarily a cause and effect, but increasing diversity might be a way to kind of help manage that. Certainly as we age and you kind of get comfortable in your diets and the things you eat, it's maybe harder to incorporate new things into your diet. Um, I will say that the process of aging is a low grade, uh, is also accompanied by the, like a low grade inflammation. It's called inflammaging. Um, and so, it becomes sort of a state by which uh, you might want to find ways to reduce inflammation kind of totally. And the, again, we're coming back to fiber, the importance of fiber, because fiber has been shown, um, the byproducts of fiber have been shown to reduce neuroinflammation in the brain. Um, a couple other things. Uh, there is evidence that vitamin D is really excellent for, um, it's not only for bone health, but also uh, immune function and immune health. And in northern latitudes like Canada, we are vitamin D deficient, especially because we spend so much time outdoors and because we're so cognizant of the importance of sunscreen. And so I always recommend, even though I'm not a, a medical doctor, I feel safe saying everyone can probably increase their vitamin D supplementation. Up to 4,000 IUs is, is recommended by the FDA. Um, and so I think everyone can benefit by, by having more um, vitamin D, certainly as well as increasing um, omega-3s in our diet. And so the, the fish oil, there's lots of evidence that that seems to be beneficial as well. Um, and so exercise is a huge thing as well, getting out and exercising. Walking is such an incredible form of exercise. It's, it's relatively easy on the joints and it is just, um, that exercise is going to promote all kinds of beneficial things that are going to help too with cognitive function. Uh, recently, there was a study published that a multivitamin helped re uh, improve, um, reduce cognitive decline in old age. So taking a multivitamin is again an important thing. And then sleep. I mean, this is a trifecta, right? Exercise, sleep, and diet. We've all been hearing about this for so long, but it's so important. So good sleep habits are very important as well. And that becomes harder as we age. Um, circadian disruptions uh, become more prevalent, especially if we have access to you know, these screens that we're kind of looking at right before bed. But there's ways to improve sleep hygiene that can help uh, with that as well. So I would say um, you know, that's sort of outside the scope of my expertise, but certainly one of the main things I've heard about sleep is ensuring that you have some regularity going to bed around the same time, and then getting out early in the morning, getting that vitamin D and that sunshine, that's gonna help reset your circadian rhythm. And so those three things combined 
are really going to play a huge role in, in combating dementia and sort of age-related um, diseases and cognitive decline. Uh, my name is Bev Trainer. Uh, the question I have is, I no longer have a thyroid gland and I take Synthroid, okay, obviously, <clears throat> to replace thyroxin. But I'm also aware that the thyroid produces enzymes and various things besides just what you get with Synthroid. So my concern is what needs to be replaced? Because on the whole, I, I feel I'm doing well in regards to <clears throat> what you've shown here so graciously and so well. Uh, but uh, that part of it, I have questions about. And I did, I was blessed to see a good endocrinologist for years, uh, but don't have the benefit of that right now. So I'm asking you that question, if you could shed light on it. So I do, I, what I can comment on is that um, subclinical hyperthyroidism is like the most di um, prescribed thing for people. I'm also taking a Synthroid as well, so I can relate to that. Um, I can't comment on the other kinds of aspects that might be deficient as a consequence of, of, of not having a thyroid gland. I would, it, w it would just be conjecture and I think not um, uh, great advice. What I can say, and I say this to everyone, is to be constantly, if, if you're feeling fatigued, or because I know that that's a big side effect with um, thyroid issues, is to request blood requisitions from your doctor. And I always recommend that people um, ask for referrals to, for specific problems, ask your doctor for a referral, and also ask for a second opinion, because I think increasingly, um, you know, the doc doctors are very overworked in this city, in this province, and um, things can get missed, and doctors are fallible, and it's important to kind of get more insight and more expertise and diverse um, opinions and perspectives on any kind of uh, medical issue. So sorry I can't offer more uh, information on that front, but uh, I hope that's somewhat helpful. Thank you very much. That was a most stimulating talk. Thank you. Um, and for your great research-based presentation, I really enjoyed that, especially the teeter-totter that you mentioned between the sympathetic and parasympathetic systems. And when you mentioned mental health research, uh, talking about how if you have anxiety, then it quells, it, it stimulates the sympathetic system and quells the parasympathetic. Thus, we would expect to see people with anxiety eating less because it would depress that hunger, the hunger need, especially in children, I imagine. Who are you? I'm Bev Mundell-Atherstone, sorry. <laughs> so that's one question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have two other questions. You spoke about the drug Ozempic. Um, it's seen as the wunderkind for weight loss in North America. But in Europe, people simply take spoonfuls of fiber, and that's the way they do weight loss. So your comment. And what's the impact of gut cleansers on the gut biomes? Thank you. Thank you for those three questions. So. Um, First, I will say in terms of activating the sympathetic nervous system, that that will suppress your parasympathetic nervous system, as you said. Um, the thing is that people with anxiety, they have chronic activation of the, the sympathetic nervous system. So chronic amounts of um, glucocorticoids, cortisol, and when even though in, in the short term you have these effects um, that might suppress appetite, you're not interested in eating if you're having to outrun a predator on the savanna. But on the long term, glucocorticoids, they can have very different effects. And uh, we know that glucocorticoids, for example, have immune suppressing effects. Um, and that's one of the reasons why steroids are, are often prescribed in the case of autoimmune diseases. So it's tricky to say, like, w children, you know, if, if anxiety can result in children eating less, but it can also result in altered mechanisms of sort of coping with emotional stress because it becomes a very complicated issue. So it's not just about, you know, 
Um, you might wonder then, well, why is there this obesity ep epidemic if we also see massive increases in anxiety? It's, it's just more complicated than the, just that seesaw. But that seesaw is like just a nice example to kind of illustrate how different techniques of relaxation, of, of kind of coming in tune with ourselves and that sort of um, the deep breathing and such, how that can be of beneficial and, and might help people that, that are prone to having stress-induced um, gut dysfunction occur. Uh, your second question about Ozempic people in Europe just taking fiber supplements, that's a, I think a much better way and a much cheaper way. Um, Ozempic, as I think I mentioned, is on track to becoming the most profitable drug ever produced. And it's not a cure, it's a weekly injection. And then when you stop taking the drug, then uh, things kind of come back. So the idea with this drug, it's I mean, beautiful um, for drug companies, is that you're on it for life. And it's really beneficial for people that are struggling to manage type 2 diabetes. But I think ultimately it can't just be the answer, you know. So I think we, the, the importance of fiber is very important and, and I think that um, treating it that way first is a better way to go. And then the final question about cleanses, cleanses. Um, your body does not need to be detoxed in a way um, through cleanses. Your body has, has been evolving for millions of years and um, whatever cleanse is on the shelf is not going to come close to doing what your body can. In fact, some of these cleanses can be dangerous. There are these, I know um, TikTok, perhaps, and this is not the audience that is you know, really into TikTok, but I know um, on TikTok there's lots of evidence of people um, saying, I got this parasite cleanse, and people are paranoid that they're full of parasites. And I can, I can t tell a lot about parasites, but um, I can assure you that we're pretty low on the parasite um, scale here in North America. Um, colon cleanses are dangerous because they can actually result in that mucus, that really important mucus membrane, that, that barrier, actually becoming um, disconnected from the sheer force of, say, these water um, colon, uh, colon um, enemas that are being sort of touted as, as excellent. Um, so, and, and then other cleanses that are just um, kind of altering the motility of your gut, they're actually kind of producing more of a uh, uh, diarrhea-like phenotype that is maybe impair impairing absorption of nutrients because if food is not in your small intestine for long enough, you're not getting those nutrients being absorbed. And also then um, it's disrupting the, the very delicate balance of, of ions needed for exchange of nutrients, but also water absorption. So those kind of things are, I think, um, you know, in a medical setting are important in some cases, but I don't think people should be doing any kind of cleanses on their own at home because they're concerned about health. Hey, thanks, Chelsea. I'm Ian Hurdle. Uh, she commented before she spoke to me that she can remember her grandmother taking her to SACPA. So I think that's kind of a congratulation to SACPA. Uh, I can remember 40 years ago when Dr. Louis in Calgary was starting his fecal transplants, i.e. poo transplants, and it was just outrageous, the reaction, <laughs> but it certainly worked out. My question for you is, can you see where we could have a mix of our natural hormones, ghrelin, uh, GLP, et cetera, that would do this obesity treatment without the needles or the side effects that we get from a Zempic? So I think that's possible. I think certainly preventative medicine is much more effective and much more cost effective as well to maintain good health. Um, and I think the issue, like it, it would be great to have, you know, that routine blood testing where you can kind of get a sense of how you respond to certain foods, how uh, some people respond to certain foods differently. They might have really huge spikes in blood glucose after a meal that then um, where another person, they might not experience that same amount of, of um, blood glucose, insulin sort of sensitivity. And so that, it's, it is very personal. And so I love the idea of being able to do sort of blood testing to identify a sort of maybe a personalized diet plan to help um, sort out what kind of foods might be beneficial for you and uh, based on your particular needs and how you respond to food. Um, I see that being possible. 
and there's technologies that are increasing in terms of um, continuous blood glucose monitors. And um, you know, I'm a big fan of collecting data for myself as well using this Fitbit. Um, I think increasingly we're going to have that access. Right now it's very expensive to do that because you have to go to these more private clinics to get that done. And it's also hard to do in, in just with your family doctor because, as I mentioned before, doctors are so overworked now. Doctors are dealing with people that are sick. They're not able to deal with people that are healthy and want to maintain health or want to um, kind of make sure that um, the horse isn't getting out of the barn before the um, doors can get closed, that kind of thing. So th I think it is possible. I think technology is going to get us there. And I think if we can find ways to um, change the healthcare system so that there's more work on preventative medicine, I think that we could also get there as well. We have two final questions. Leona has the second last. The moderator gets the last. It should be quick. You mentioned earlier in response to something else about sleep hygiene. And I'm just wondering if there's eating hygiene in terms of the amounts, how frequently, and when during the day one should be consuming food. So I think this is also a very personal thing as well. So children. You know, they need to eat small meals and they need to eat often. And I think on one hand, you know, we tell our kids, finish everything on your plate, eat it all. In some ways you're overriding their natural satiety um, sort of assessments. And so that maybe isn't a great thing. And that's kind of part of food hygiene. I think it's important to let yourself recognize when you're full and not go beyond that. Um, but also eating mindfully, not in front of screens, and I know that's also hard, especially during the playoffs, right? Um, which are right at dinner times. But uh, I think that the mindful eating is an important component to, I mean, portion control, I mean, portions are huge, right? Um, in, in some restaurants, for example. And I think it's just really uh, easy to get that kind of distorted. Um, so some people, you know, as children, and their exposure to food, I think, is really um, kind of a different story than it is with adults. I think increasingly there's so, it seems like food is a part of everything. Like you can't go anywhere, I can't go anywhere with my kids and if I'm not armed with eight different snacks, for example. And it feels like uh, the reward for many different things ends up being some sort of sweet treat, um, which is great. The kids love it. But I think ultimately it sort of reinforces this cultural obsession with food and access to food all the time. You can never be hungry, right? Um, and this kind of brings me to, um, as we age, uh, it's OK to be hungry. Um, and there's uh, different techniques um, some people use for um, weight control or just feeling good. Um, for example, intermittent fasting. This is where you um, restrict your eating to certain time periods. And it's Dangerous to say this around teenagers because of concerns with, with body dysmorphia and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but I think you know we can safely talk about it here. And, and so I'm a proponent of intermittent fasting. It works for me. And I sometimes will just you know not eat the sacred breakfast. I know we, we've grown up learning that breakfast is so sacred. I find I can easily skip breakfast and then just kind of constrict my eating to certain periods. Um, I think eating, bef like it's really also good to, to stop eating um, but for several hours before you go to bed. That's important for eating hygiene as well as sleep hygiene. Um, and I think, but the intermittent fasting is really interesting. Um, there's like in rats, if you restrict their food, they will live longer. Um, there's these interesting kind of nutrient sensors in the body and actually restricting food has all of these additional benefits in terms of getting this metabolic switch where you're starting to burn ketones instead of um, instead of um, sugars as a fuel. And some people find this really great for mental clarity. Um, so that's something that I do sometimes. I guess I recently learned that the Prime Minister of um, uh, Britain does a, a weekly fast, for example, for 36 hours. Um, so anyway, but you know, then I moderate that with thinking, okay, I'm actually getting, my son who said I'm, that I was getting a little bit grumpy, maybe I should eat something. <laughs> and so I thought, oh, I'm gonna give these fasts a little break now and just go back to something that's a bit more sustainable. I kind of like the idea that we can treat our body as a little bit of a, of a gentle science experiment and find out what works for you. But I do think that there is ways that we can improve our eating hygiene by maybe 
um, accepting it's okay to sometimes be hungry, accepting it's okay to maybe not finish what, what's on your plate because you don't want to override your natural society signals, especially when you're learning that as children. Um, so I hope I, I was able to answer some of your questions there. I'm going to give myself the privilege of the last question. Um, uh, fasting is, a, I want to come back to your comments on fasting. Fasting is part of the Christian tradition and I'm, your speaking has reminded me of the theologian uh, of another chapter in my life who, who thought it was good to fast for a week because it, it was body cleansing, cleansed the body of all kinds of toxins. Any comment on that? Um, certainly, again, it's a very personalized thing. Some people would be, really enjoy that challenge. I think other people would be miserable and it would really be detrimental to their health and the health of their families. Um, this kind of actually reminds me of this cool study that came out in Israel. Um, they looked at the sentencing imposed by judges before lunch and after lunch. <laughs> and they found that the judge was giving more lenient or more likely to um, grant parole after lunch, after they had eaten. So I think that says something too about the way we have to kind of operate in society. Um, we can't just um, maybe just all be uh, fasting machines. Some people, some judges, you know, really uh, need to eat. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, th these sort of traditions, they're interesting in many ways. And I, I know that there are studies that, that examine people that say do um, the Ramadan fasting, for example. And there's interesting evidence about how their blood glucose um, um, changes over periods of fasting, different kinds of fasting. But I think it's a very personal decision and I think that it's hard to say if it's good or bad. It really depends on your circumstances. I just sort of bring it out there as a possibility. Some people might try challenging themselves and seeing if, you know, if they might find it something good. For me, if I'm eating lots of sweets, I find like, ex like you know, extending a fast can kind of almost reset my palate a little bit, um, for example. So. Um, but you know, I might I feel differently about that maybe during um, more stressful times, um, or when my kids are um, home for summer break, for example. So uh, again, a very personal experience, but it, it's interesting. It's interesting how fasting has evolved in our culture in different ways, many different um, religions, for example. So there's something to that, I think. Um, we're about to close, but uh, our tradition is to give the uh, speaker the last word, and so I wonder if there's any take home message you want or some question you wished we'd asked that we didn't? Anyway, you get the last word. Oh, the last word. Um, I guess if I have to do a last word, it's gonna be a very, very broad last word and that is um, recognizing that gut health is so connected to brain health and mental health. It's very important that we have healthy diets and healthy diets are very expensive. It's much more expensive to buy fruits and vegetables than it is to buy fast food. Overall, the more processed food is, the worse it is for you. Um, and so, but that makes it hard. I understand that, especially a parent of young children, it's just so much easier to grab something uh, quick and easy. What I do think is that there's some really amazing research being done to understand the impacts that, that diet has on us on people, as well as different populations of people that are maybe more vulnerable, um, like pregnant women, um, children with um, developmental disorders, um, all kinds of groups of people. And we are learning so much about different ways that we can use our diet as a form of medicine. So I would say, in the closing, as a society, if we want healthy bodies, healthy minds, we need to support research, which is a public good, and we need to um, use our political capital to support uh, governments who are supporting research and who are supporting health care. Because if we don't have uh, effective health care, then we're just going to be constantly trying to get the horse back in the barn rather than finding ways to um, teach people really what good health is. The science is evolving so quickly, it is impossible to get it into a, a textbook and into the school curriculum quick enough. Um, but doctors are learning these things. They go to workshops and they learn about these things. They have um, the capacity to, to teach people, but they can't if they're just overworked to the extent that they are now. So I would say um, uh, funding research and funding healthcare are very important. And so, you know, see what you can do with your political will to support that. Thank you.